This is Optimal Living Daily, episode 2000, Four Things Procrastinators Need to Learn by David Kane of raptitude.com. And I'm Justin Mollick coming to you upside down. That's not a Stranger Things reference. I actually am upside down right now recording. Why? Well, it was reported quite a while back by James Cridland of Pod News that supposedly your voice sounds better upside down because the vocal cords are relaxed. I am definitely not relaxed right now. So you tell me, does my voice sound better? All right. I can't do the whole intro like this. I think that's enough. So if you actually want to see me recording that first section there upside down, I got it on video. Just go to oldpodcast.com slash 2000. And I have a link in this episode's description too. It's kind of weird, but an interesting watch. And you can see how I recorded myself upside down. Anyway, it is episode 2000. And something I like to do on milestone episodes is take a little break. Well, that and let some of the authors I've narrated over the years come on and voice an article themselves, their own article if they're up for it. And today I was lucky enough to get David Kane of raptitude.com to come on. I asked him a while back, I think like a thousand episodes ago, and he actually attempted it, but wasn't happy with how it turned out, which I totally get. And after he went through a major life update recently, or realization, I should say, and a big change, I thought I'd reach out to him again and see if he wanted to give it another shot. He said yes, which means a lot. So thank you for being here for the 2000th episode to support him and to support this show. I couldn't have done it without the authors and without you following or subscribing and listening every day. It's completely changed my life and hopefully yours too. I don't want to keep this intro too long. It's already long enough. So here's David Kane as we optimize your life. Four Things Procrastinators Need to Learn Read by the author, David Kane. One litmus test for being a serious procrastinator. There are items on your to-do list that were there a year ago. A year is more than 1% of even a very long life. What could be so difficult or intimidating that we'd avoid it for that long? For some of us, anything really. Making a doctor's appointment, cleaning out the trunk, fixing a leaky faucet. To be a chronic procrastinator is to be fooled repeatedly by the same illusions about how your mind works and how things actually get done. You hit the same ruts, spin out in the same place and misunderstand what happened in the same way as every other time. Once in a while, you spot one of these mirages right before you step into it again, and finally see the truth behind the illusion. Here are four such truths I wish I could tell my younger self. Number one. Confidence comes after you start, not before. To the procrastinator, starting a task always feels dangerous, because it's the first moment you can be exposed as a hack or a fool. You can ponder, plan, and envision a task indefinitely, while enjoying a certain sense of safety. But the moment of actually starting brings real-world dangers into the picture. Failure, ridicule, complications, and maybe the discovery of a new, deeper level to your ineptitude. So before you start, you look for a little more assurance that things will go well for you. This inevitably leads to more planning, more thinking, perhaps some flowcharting of possibilities, either mentally or on paper, maybe some haphazard web research. One reliable standby is a thorough round of house cleaning, in order to clarify the mind? Or why not a spa day to rejuvenate? How prepared do you need to feel? It's hard to say, but it's always a little more than you feel now. Confidence is helpful for any task, but in reality, there's little you can do to create it before starting. Once you actually start the task itself, things begin to fall into order. You quickly discover where the real effort is required, what's surprisingly easy, and what possibilities you can ignore. The tendrils of the flowchart fall away. You just do the next thing. Almost magically, the task shrinks before you because it's no longer composed entirely of your imagination. Only then, when some of the reality of the task is behind you, does confidence make its first appearance. Number two, your dilemmas seem tangled together only until you solve one of them. The longer and dustier your to-do list gets, the more it seems like a hopeless tangle of interconnected problems. You have no idea how long anything will take and what new problems will emerge when you dig into something. There's a fear of making things worse. Your list begins to look like a great singular problem, a cursed ball of Christmas lights that will take a correspondingly great singular effort in order to untangle. This great effort is always scheduled for next Monday. In reality, the tangle isn't real. It's a mirage that is created when you try to map out everything in your head without actually doing anything. Work is always done in pieces and you never know quite what any of it looks like until it is happening. As David Allen says, you can't do a project. You can only do actions, and projects are nothing but lists of actions. 
Even huge projects are made up only of sketches, phone calls, brush strokes, application forms, little circles made with a polishing cloth, and other tiny, eminently doable actions. Even when you're literally untangling knotted cords, it's only ever a matter of patiently passing one strand back along itself while you ignore everything else. It's when you're trying to trace the path entirely in your head that it feels hopeless. And that hopeless mental task is what the procrastinator is always trying to do, foresee all real difficulties well enough in advance that they can be avoided perfectly. It's impossible. You have to choose a piece and solve it. Once you have, the illusion is dispelled and hopelessness lifts. Mark my word, the whole list looks different the moment you knock off one tough thing. Number three, finishing is everything. Working on is useless or worse. Finish something every time you sit down to work. Get to the end of a chapter, a section, a definite stage of some sort. Don't just work on something. It's entirely possible to feel a rich sense of progress without actually getting closer to accomplishing anything. In fact, it's easy to inadvertently make a task bigger as you work on it. You keep adding, refining, replacing, and second-guessing. And at the end of the day, you have more work, not less. If you can't answer the question, what are you trying to finish right now, then you're probably making the task bigger rather than moving towards its end. To dispel this illusion, I often write on a scrap of paper what I'm trying to accomplish in this session. I have one beside me now. It says, rough drafts of all four sections. It's easy to overlook the necessity of finishing, especially if you're not used to getting much done, because the sense of joy that comes with getting somewhere can be present even when that somewhere hasn't been defined. Even a ship going in circles feels fast. Number four. Doing feels dangerous and stalling feels safe, but the opposite is true. Procrastination involves a great amount of thinking about doing without much actual doing. This thinking is involuntary and often painful, and only ceases after the doing starts. Through your mind's eye, you can live and relive the horror and struggle of jobs you haven't even started. This imagined struggle can last months or years, even for tasks that end up taking less than an hour. In response to these mental horrors, the procrastinator bides their time, as though delay is an advantage. Yes, I'll do it later, when I am more psychologically prepared, when I've assembled all my resources, when I can bring the full weight of a new Monday morning to the job. Meanwhile, new layers of difficulty are settling onto the original task. By rescheduling the beginning, you've made the task harder, taller, more dangerous in your mind. Lead time is burning away, along with any momentum you may have had. Then there's shame for having waited so long which makes the prospect of asking for help go from unpleasant to unthinkable. Beginning anything without a lot of confidence seems dangerous, but the real danger is delay. Biding your time seems like a move towards safety and self-assuredness, but you don't actually move anywhere. The task gets even harder, while real predictable dangers advance on you. Missed deadlines, penalties, shame, stress, and further damage to your confidence. Almost always, the most predictable, most damaging, and most easily avoidable dangers come from stalling. The longer you spend doing a nervous little warm-up dance, the taller the diving board grows. Thank you again to David. Come by raptitude.com to show him support. I'm really happy that he gave it another shot and successfully pulled it off. Is it just me, or did his recording sound super meditative, like he could totally host a meditation podcast? I know he hosts Camp Calm, so that must be a really great experience. Anyway, David was one of the early authors on this show. I found him through a recommendation because he experimented with being vegan for a month and then wrote about it. He has an experiments section on his site that's worth checking out, but his articles have also been some of my favorites. I can still recall some that I narrated years ago. So thank you again to David. Thank you for being here, especially if you're here every day with me. I can't keep doing this without you. I've learned so much thanks to authors like David. I hope you have too. And all I can ask is that they keep letting me share their work and you keep listening. That means the world to me. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Have a great rest of your day. And I got a bit of an announcement and special something tomorrow too. So I'll see you there where your optimal life awaits.